Caroline Chester, and I'm a plastic surgeon, and um, I'm very glad to have the opportunity to come meet you all and speak about uh, plastic surgery after um, weight loss. Um, I've got a few slides here to show you if I can make this her work. Is it green? It's green. It should have the push the center. And there's a little. Uh, the center button turns on the, oh, you know what, I bet it's this. Oh, yes. No. Sorry. Here we go. Um, let's try this one. And that just turns it off. Well, while Dr. Chester works on her technical side, I can tell you this, that she has a lovely, lovely bedside manner. All right. That's the best part. You ready to go? <laughs> You've got it ready. All right. Thank you, madam. All right, so um, just a, by way of introduction, um, I grew up in Chattanooga, Tennessee. I uh, came here to Nashville to college at Vanderbilt, then um, went to Memphis, uh, to uh, University of Tennessee Medical School, and then I sort of went uh, out of the region and went to New England uh, to do all my uh, training. Um, I went to, did my general surgery training uh, at the Beth Israel Hospital in Boston, which is a Harvard-affiliated hospital, and then um, while I was doing general surgery, I spent two years at NIH, went back to Boston, finished up my general surgery. Um, and then I did uh, my plastic surgery residency, also at a Harvard training hospital, uh, the Brigham and Women's, which is associated with the Children's Hospital there, uh, Boston Children's Hospital. And then I did a year fellowship at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. And then um, I moved down to Washington, D.C., sort of back to the south, um, and uh, was on faculty, full-time faculty, at George Washington University for about 10 years and then um, decided to come closer to home and came here to Nashville into private practice and that was in 2002 so I've been here 10 years now um, just uh, you guys probably all know this but when I was looking at bariatric uh, surgery when we when it, it first became a specialty um, it's an interesting word, and it's basically the art of, med of medicine dealing with the cause, prevention, and treatment of obesity. Uh, and um, we plastic surgeons have an opportunity to participate in this. Um, as you all know better than I do, the diff there are various and sundry different uh, gastric bypass procedures. There's the gastric banding, which is um, the least invasive because it doesn't remove stuff. Uh, and then um, the RUI. A bypass, and then there's a biliopancreatic diversion. Um, the RUI gastric by bypass and biliopancreatic diversion both have, as you all well know, the, some metabolic con consequences that we as plastic surgeons need to know about um, because there are certain things that make you all who've had that procedure special so that we can get you to heal well after surgery. And that needs to always be in one's mind as we're helping you guys. Um, so what do we do? Basically, we take off skin. And it's just um, when your skin has been stretched uh, significantly, um, whether from gaining weight um, or from pregnancy, um, it's a sort of the same principle. I'm sorry. Um, it's the same principle. Uh, that you have extra skin, it's stretched out, it doesn't go back to where it once was, and then hug the contour of your uh, frame. Uh, so you've got extra skin. 
and it can be abdominal extra skin, breast extra skin. Uh, we have several gentlemen in the audience, even in men, that uh, have extra skin in their chest and chest, um, thighs, arms, uh, buttocks, and face and, and neck as well. Um, they're all lifts, and they all involve removal of extra skin and subcutaneous tissue. Um, and some do involve some muscle tightening or fascial tightening more often um, because the fascia also can be uh, stretched out in certain instances, especially, for example, with the stomach. Um, timing of surgery, I prefer to do surgery after the majority of the weight loss has been achieved. Once you've gotten down either close to or to your ideal weight um, and you've plateaued, you're, there's, you guys know this better than I do, again, um, but as you lose weight, you're going to lose and lose and lose and lose, and then you sort of slow your loss, and you're getting down to where you really should be, and um, then you'll just plateau. And so right along in there is when the best time to do your surgery is. Often after people plateau, they'll, come, they'll, they'll sort of bounce up a little bit. Uh, five to ten pounds, and then stay there. And so, once within that you know, twenty pounds difference um, is when the best time is. A sticky subject: insurance coverage. Um, unfortunately, most insurance companies consider these lifts uh, to be something that you can do without. Um, because your medical issues, for the most part, have been addressed by the weight loss. Your blood pressure comes down, your asthma gets better, and your blood sugars get under control, and the insurance companies really don't think that much about your state of mind in the current climate. Um, so uh, most of the time, most of the procedures are not covered. On a rare occasion, with a, with a huge abdominal pernicious, um, they will cover excision of the paniculus, um, but, but it's really just excision of the paniculus. It's not really a lift, if that makes sense. Um, uh, and they will cover breast reduction surgery. And the way they figure out, we figure out if they're going to cover breast reduction surgery is they have this lovely chart, and it actually works pretty well. Um, it's, it's, it's most of the people who should be covered for breast reduction surgery are covered um, by most of the insurance companies. There's a few that have a chart that's skewed to their advantage. Um, but most people can get breast reduction covered, and uh, it's a it's sort of a percentage of your total body surface area. It's, like it's, it's a height and weight uh, measurement. So everybody's body size and shape are different. There's not a one-size-fits-all situation for, for post-periodic surgery. Everybody stores fat in different locations of their body and at different rates, and you lose it differently. Some people lose first in their face, some people lose first in their abdomen. It's, it's very different how people and where people um, store and then lose fat. Um, and in addition, when we all look in the mirror, and I don't care if you weigh 300 pounds or if you weigh 103 pounds, almost every, especially women, who look in the mirror will always find something they just wish they could change. Um, so every person has their own area of dissatisfaction with their bodies and what they would change and what they would change first and what they can live with. And so, um, I think it's important to listen to people and, and see if our opinions agree or disagree and um, what, what bothers you the most about where um, your problems are. This, these are three different people um, with three different issues from uh, abdominoplasty and, that need abdominoplasty and have uh, some degree of stretched out skin. The large picture, uh, right, let's see, I get to work right. Um, here on this side, uh, this abdominal paniculus, her belly button is here, um, and she's having difficulty walking. And this is the kind of paniculus 
that you can get at least part of the procedure covered and buy insurance because she really does have trouble walking and it's a problem. And uh, so um, we went, she had um, the dermoplasty and went for, I've got a picture in a few minutes and you can see what her post op looked like. Um, this is a girl who actually has never had children, she just has a big tummy. Um, she's not terribly overweight, but she's a big girl. Um, and this is a lady after pregnancy who just has this big stretched up thing in the middle. Uh, it's the typical postpartum uh, abdomen. So there are four different kinds of, uh, of abdominoplasties. There's a mini abdominoplasty that we take out skin from the belly button down. And that's the simplest kind of abdominoplasty. It takes the least amount of time. Uh, there's a full abdominoplasty where we um, lift up the skin all the way up to your rib cage. The, all everywhere, and uh, then stretch everything down uh, and relocate the uh, umbilicus, uh, make a new hole, uh, basically leave it where it's supposed to be, but make a new hole in the abdominal flap. Um, then there's the belt, abdominoplasty, a circumferential abdominoplasty, or a body lift. It's known by lots of different names, but it's basically we go 360 around your waist, and we lift both your abdomen, uh, and uh, behind uh, the buttock, we can lift that and get rid of some of the folds uh, on the back. Then the fleur de lis procedure is sort of, most of the time it's an additional procedure to the transverse incision that we usually make. And it's a midline incision. And it's for people who have really a lot of bulk in this direction as well as um, vertically. Uh, so we make a midline incision as well as a transverse incision. Obviously, that takes a little bit more care to, uh, so healing uh, progresses without any complications. And then uh, we can also repair the diastasis. Um, oftentimes, uh, in obesity, you also have a component of intra-abdominal obesity. And just like pregnancy, it stretches out the abdominal wall and can spread out the uh, rectus muscles that go up and down and are responsible for helping you do sit-ups. Um, and so we can bring those back together and that can tighten your, your, your torso basically uh, in, in this direction and also um, help you with be able to do sit-ups a little bit better and most importantly it gives you a waist back. <laughs> So this is the, the lady um, that was in that photograph, the pre-op photograph, and a side view so you can see how far down the goes. Mm -hmm. And then this is after surgery. Um, uh, and we did go all the way around for her. Um, so that not only is all this gone, but this is lifted up a little bit, over here is lifted up a little bit, um, and she can now wear regular clothes, mm -hmm. uh, which she could not do before. So is it perfect? She doesn't have a perfect shape, but boy, is she better. Mm -hmm. So this is the girl who has never had children. She's just a big girl, and she's got this big old tummy. Um, and uh, so our incisions for abdominoplasty usually go uh, really from iliac crest to iliac crest. Sometimes we do what we call go from table to table, uh, from one side as far as we can go to the other side as far as we can go, um, and then uh, take everything off Tighten up that uh, rectus abdominis in, underneath all the skin. This is a new location for her belly button. This skin down here used to be up above her belly button up there. Okay. And then this is somebody who's had a tremendous amount of weight loss. Um, and um, she has a tremendous amount of skin and extra stuff. Um, and uh, for these uh, people, uh, she had the floor delay. She had to make the midline incision and the transverse incision, and we also went all the way around for her. Um, and I, for somebody that that's, needs this much, I don't like to do breast surgery at the same time I do a massive abdominal surgery. It just healing doesn't take place as well, and you sort of set yourself up for complications, in my opinion, if you try to do too much with one surgery. Um, so sometimes I'll do simple breasts. And, and abdominal plasties at the same time. I never do thighs and, and tummies at the same time. I think it's, again, it sets you up for problems. 
questions? Then this is the, the posterior view. Now, for her, um, I've got actually further pictures down the road for her breasts. Um, so what we're going to do for her is we're going to address this stuff up here um, when we actually do her breast surgery. Okay, so you can put that in your brain and, and think about that. Um, of note, I did do work on her arms um, at the same time we did this. I will do arms and tummy together. Um, and there's a, a clear difference between this and this and this. Um, and then this is a, another uh, belt abdominoplasty from the rear, uh, just to give you another idea. And you can see she's, she's now she's got this nice little waist uh, here, which is really nice. So breast reduction uh, versus breast lift. Um, again, it depends on the amount of volume that we can take off. These are four different people uh, with four different issues. Um, and every again, everybody's different. Everybody has a different issue. Everybody needs a little bit different procedure to get where we want to go. Um, this lady has a simple breast reduction. Um, she's uh, not a, 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 a bariatric patient. Um, she's just a regular patient that needed a breast reduction. So her in here so you can see um, what can be expected from just a regular old, normal uh, breast reduction procedure and um, the way I do them is that usually there's oops, usually there's uh, enough skin that we have to take out that the incisions end up being around the nipple areolar complex they go from the nipple areolar complex down where the breast meets the wall and then underneath the breast um, and the distance they go underneath the breast depends on how much skin we have to take out. Um, this is a, a bariatric patient, and not only did she have um, lots of uh, tissue out here, you can see the tissue that's out here on her flanks, and I did um, cheat a little bit because I included some of this tissue in her weight for her um, breast reduction, but it's not really cheating because breast tissue does go out that far. So, um, but, but she did have all this, this tissue back here that we um, took off at the same time we did her reduction. Um, and we corrected her uh, asymmetry. She has a, a more of a tubular type breast, what we call a tubular type breast deformity. Um, so this is her post op. And she's also had a tummy damage. This is another bariatric patient. Um, she's she's uh, fairly young. Um, she has great skin. Her skin has just done beautifully. And she had basically a regular old-fashioned uh, breast reduction. Um, now her skin stretched a little bit, so her inframammary incision uh, ended up being just a wee bit high. You can see it right there. And it goes from there on around to over there. And then we did a regular abdominal plastic. You can kind of see here that her abdominal contour is uh, improved. And this is a lady who, who had a, a simple lift. Um, we took off a little bit of tissue, but not enough to consider a breast reduction. And it was mostly a lift. And she had just lots of extra uh, floppy skin and tissue. Um, now, this is back to our uh, lady who had the fleur de lis abdominoplasty. And someone else, I didn't do this, someone else uh, had done a lift for her. Oh, I know what it was. Uh, someone had done a reduction for her when she was heavy. And um, I prefer to wait on reductions until you've lost your weight because you just don't know what's going to happen to your breast tissue. Um, she had ended up a little bit asymmetric, and they ended up putting a, a unilateral implant in. So this is an implant. This breast does not have an implant. So once you lift all that floppy stuff up, she's roughly even volume-wise, but she certainly isn't even the way she looks. Um, and she, when she lost weight, she lost all her tissue in her breast. So we, we did a little thing. I, I like to do this where we take tissue from out over here, and we use this stuff to augment the breast. 
and um, you end up with a, with a scar, which is the trade-off. Um, so her scar starts in her axilla and goes around like this. Um, but she's got nice, uh, firm-looking tissue in there that's her tissue um, that works very nicely. And she's got a little bit of an asymmetry uh, there um, on her liberal complex, but her general breast area is, a, is symmetric. Now, if I can't get enough tissue by doing that, then sometimes I will put implants in um, if you need the augmentation. And sometimes we can get some help from the insurance company and we can do uh, uh, take out enough tissue for, so the insurance will pay that and reduce your, uh, significantly reduces your anesthesia and facility cost. And then um, we can um, pop some implants in and give you more forms that way. Arm lift, this is another example of an arm lift. You can't see it, but she does have, and some of the scars are variable. Some scars are gorgeous, and you can't hardly see them. Some scars are really awful, and there's really not a good way to predict who's going to have what. Um, I try not to put things under too much tension because when we have tight scars, they tend to spread. Um, uh, but there's, it's still unpredictable. But the other thing you do is you try to leave that scar right in this um, groove where the cephalic vein runs, uh, and it, it's the least noticeable. Thigh lift, this is a, a pretty minimal thigh lift. Uh, she's got wrinkly skin over here, and it's pretty close up to the top. This is the best kind of thigh lift to have. You get the best result. Um, and so this is afterwards. Your stuff has, has gotten improved significantly. Another thigh lift, she's just deflated that skin. Uh, again, she's got lots of skin. Um, there's two ways sometimes that we can do this. Normally, we try to leave our incisions just in the groin because those are pretty invisible. Um, but sometimes we do need to make incisions down here uh, to reduce the circumference. In order to get a nice result. So it's a trade, you know, everything in life is a trade off. And it's a trade off depending on what the scar is going to look like and what your contour is going to look like. Um, and then face and neck lift. Um, sometimes that's another thing to do as well. Um, potential complications we always give scars. And it's a matter of locating those scars trying to minimize them, um, putting them in places where they're not as noticeable. Um, uh, for those of you who've had uh, gastric bypass procedures rather than abandoned procedures, um, you need to have good uh, uh, hematocrits uh, and iron levels. And that, to me, is one of the most important things to get you to heal well. Um, we use drains to prevent seromas, but sometimes we still get seromas. Um, which is collection of fluids underneath the skin flaps because we lift up a lot of skin. Um, infection um, can happen. Um, you can have delayed wound healing um, and the metabolic complications. But fortunately, we don't see many metabolic complications. You guys know how to manage what you eat and drink. We do very well. Um, my hat is off to bariatric patients. I think what you all accomplish is amazing, and you don't get enough credit. Um, but I find that post bariatric patients are energetic, they're determined, it's a life changing procedure, an event, um, and they're fantastic people, and I really like taking care of them because they're inspirational. So my job is to do a small part to help you to go from this to this. So do you guys have any questions about specifics? How long does the healing take after surgery? Depends on the procedure. And Dr. Chester, will you repeat the question? Oh, sorry. Yeah, so that way it'll Across. Okay. Um, the question was, how long does it take to to heal after surgery? And it really depends on the procedure. It depends on 
how many procedures you have done, what areas you have worked on, and how extensive it has been. Um, I'm very conservative because I don't like complications, and so I kind of ride herd on you. Um, and that, um, so I'll limit your activity significantly uh, for really six weeks. Uh, for the first three weeks, I don't like you doing much other than walking. You can walk as much as you want, uh, but I don't like any bouncing for most procedures. I don't like bouncing. I don't like um, uh, vigorous uh, sweating exercises, but you can walk till the cows come home and your energy gets out. Um, so three, week is, three weeks is a big mark, um, and then six weeks is another big mark. And the six-week mark, um, if, if everything has gone smoothly, you feel pretty good. The abdominal plasty takes the longest to heal. The arms take the quickest to heal. Um, the thighs are in an awkward placement for the incision, so you, you just have to be careful with those. You have to, you're down for a while just to not move so that they can heal, but you do have to walk. So you, um, does that help? I usually tell people they need uh, four to six weeks out of work for um, abdominal plasties. Uh, for breast surgery, it's variable. Um, if I could ask something for that, would you say that obeying the same rules as right after your bariatric surgery? dietarily will help you recover faster. Um, back in October, I had uh, a full abdominal plasty in the thighs um, with the with the early cut, and I pumped in as much protein as I could get after after surgery, um, and then walked. You know, again, same rules after my bariatric surgery. The protein is key. Yes. That protein intake is is it takes a lot of energy and a lot of protein to heal. And then the, the other thing my surgeon told me is that you've already lost the weight, don't try to be a weight loss here, you need the calories too. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. Just me. The abdominal last day like I know everybody's different and some may be on longer than others, but is there a typical average time involved that you're out under the knife for the surgery itself? Or just for the regular? Um, for a regular full yeah, of plastic? Full, yeah. Um, about three hours. Three hours. And how long did you stay in hospital after that? We used to keep everyone in hospital, and there's mm -hmm. this very cool thing these days called a pain pump. <laughs> yes. That is a very cool thing. <laughs> it's a very cool thing. Big fan of it. Yes. So for those of you on on uh, on the video, a, a pain pump is um, a, a little device. It's a little tiny tube that goes in, and it delivers a very small amount of local anesthetic to your operative site for forty eight hours. And it allows you to go home the same day as the wow. with the exception of the full body lift. Mm -hmm. Those patients okay. need to stay in because they don't need to be right in the car right. quite so soon. They really, I, I, those, those dates stay in, but just one night, they go home the next day. I think, Dr. Chester, there might be some confusion because these folks have re recently had PCAs. Oh, that pain pump. That kind of thing. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, that pain pump is, is is actually different, and that is also wonderful. But this is a little this is a little um, it's a little thing that you carry, and it's preloaded with local anesthetic, and mm -hmm. it it just slowly drips um, anesthesia, for example, into the the over the muscle fascia mm -hmm. after abdominoplasty, and um, it works. Oh, it is the greatest. Oh. <laughs> Mine was about the size of a grapefruit. And they, they gave you this little purse. A little fanny pack. Dr. Chester, what about um, drains and like um, binders and stuff after surgery? Do you do any of that? 
Yeah, ab water. absolutely. Um, abdominoplasties always have drains. Um, I always do uh, drains on our breast reductions. Not always on the breast lifts, depending on how large a surface area we're dealing with and what, how much we're dealing. Um, thighs, uh, I sometimes do, sometimes don't lose drains. Um, uh, um, with uh, thigh lifts, you go home in this cute little uh, girdle uh, thing, um, uh, and you stay in it for a while. You stay. I like people to stay in it like for a week. Um, and we're used to wearing spanks every day. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, the abdominal plastic, we send you home in a, in, a, in a abdominal binder. And there are some patients will be happy to get rid of their binder at you know, four weeks, some at six weeks. Some people are still wearing abdominal binders or some sort of spanks or something for six months um, and feeling very comfortable with that. Um, uh, we send you home in a, uh, for breast things, we send you home in a, in a garment as well. Is that yeah, just in your office is in the medical office building across the street from the classroom here, correct? Correct. And you operate at Centennial? Correct. And um, the other thing I was going to ask you is, um, you, do you help people file for their insurance? if there's a possibility of doing that and help them get coverage if it's possible? Yes, yes. I, my office staff is really good at that. How do they do that? How do they do that? Yes. Um, you come for a visit, we take photographs because all the insurance companies want photographs because they have strict criteria um, that they will use to make their decision. So they tell us. Um, so we should put the on screen something. Um uh, and, then, uh, and then we send a letter to the to the insurance company and then they will send us and you a letter back. Um, and then once you get the letter, if you get the letter first, you call us. If we get the letter first, we call you. Uh, and then we compare notes. Well, I have a question. Um, I know I have a certain goal that I would like to get to as far as weight. And that involves the loss of about 170 pounds. Um, is, if you get to that, is there additional weight loss? Is the, um, skin is taken off or is that something that helps you get to that ideal goal? That's a very good question. The question is it, once you get to the point where you have uh, your surgery, how much weight do you actually lose at the time of surgery? Less than you would think. Mm -hmm. um, um, like seven to ten pounds five to <laughs> More in the range of five to six. It truly is less than you would think. And we do weigh all of our uh, things we take off. Um, and so it really is less than you would think. If, if, if I could offer my, my, my own perspective on it, because I have, um, you know, my first round of plastic in October, and hopefully I'll be doing the next round next month. Um, because just like Dr. Chester, my, my surgeon doesn't do the top half and the bottom half at the same time. Um, I lost 170 pounds before my plastic surgery. They took seven and a half pounds of skin during surgery. Um, because I lost actually 50% of my body weight before surgery. Um, and then because of the swelling and stuff, I actually wound up gaining about five pounds of cash when I went home after my plastic surgery. So. Yes, don't get on the scales. <laughs> 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 and Catherine was like, I'm a little worse about that. She's tried to tell me for years to get the scale. You will be very disappointed when you're more than you were when you went in. <laughs> and it does take several weeks yeah. to equilibrate. And I was dealing with swelling for three months. Just if I would overdo it, I'd see you know, myself balloon and stuff. Um, yeah, it, it, it's one of those things where you have to 
you know, do what they tell us in group all the time. Pay attention to your plan, stick to your plan, and trust that the scale is going to be correct. Okay. Okay. Shall I ask for you how much her initial consultation fee is? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, our usual cosmetic for anything uh, consultation fee is fifty dollars, um, and uh, if you guys tell the office folks that you came to the seminar, we can waive that fee. Ah. Information. And will you reconfirm this? Do you want people to lose their total amount of weight before they see you, or are you willing? We have some people that have some real issues. They haven't lost all their weight, but they've got some difficult issues with this pendulous abdomen. So you would be willing to see them if they're stable, but they're not totally at their weight loss? Yes, yes. But, you know, um, your final result, if you can stick it out, is so much better mm -hmm. if you can stick it out and do it at the end. It truly, if you can just figure out somehow to get through it mm -hmm. and keep going, you just you just have a better result. There's all there is to it. Um, do you think maybe for some people who haven't gone through it, because I know if you read obesity health and some of that, there's some real horror stories about the plastics consultation and in the process. Yeah, some some of which sound like prison delousing scenes from B rated movies. Um, so I must say I've never read any of those. <laughs> so you know, maybe for people who have read some of those but haven't haven't been to see a certain you know, What do we do? What do I do? Yeah, okay. You come in the office, you put on a gown, you meet my my front desk people, they bring you back, mm -hmm. you put on a gown, um, and then uh, um, they take a little bit of a history and figure out what you're here for. And then I come in and we chat and find out what you're here for. And then we have a look and see what you got and what your issues are. And uh, then uh, we uh, chat and uh, then we chat a little bit more. <laughs> and uh, um, then uh, we take some pictures, and that's the worst part. There's no way about it. There's that in taking pictures mm -hmm. is the worst part. You just, it's just <laughs> awful. And I apologize, mm -hmm. but what are you gonna do? Mm -hmm. I do. And there's no laughing and pointing. And <laughs> <laughs> I promise. <laughs> Unless you're laughing at me. <laughs> trying to make me they say, stop holding it in. You're right. <laughs> You've pretty much seen everything there is to see about plastic surgery issues, I bet. Oh, I can't. Pretty close. <laughs> I would say pretty close. Yeah. Which, which procedure is the most popular? The, the lower end of the face? Um, Abdomen and breast. Abdomen and breast. Because it makes such a difference in, in clothing. You know, you may not drop many pounds, but how many pant sizes did you drop? Uh, about one. Only one? Yeah. That's pretty good. I know. The, um, the, the, the biggest change for me was just how stuff fit after. I wasn't tucking and, you know, trying to rearrange all my skin, and for me, sleeping. The hardest part was sleeping. I would roll over at night and pinch that skin underneath me. And, you know, my, my, my first night at home, even though I was sleeping with my feet raised on pillows and things like that, my first night in my home bed without that skin was just amazing. You know, it's like paying something, having sanitary napkins, getting all of my body didn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, they were cheaper than surgical masks. Right. Yeah. I've been there for a long time not to be the people to go buy this. I just wish they still made the ones without the plastic. Yes. Yeah. Yeah.
because the plastic. Yes, they were fantastic. The plastic can be problematic. It was it was the second best surgery I ever did. Well, we hope we know what the first one was. <laughs> <laughs> question is what about uh, abdominal uh, adhesions um, after intra abdominal surgery just like everywhere else your body can make scar and adhesions are basically scar tissue that connect pieces of the bowel together so that instead of slipping freely through your abdomen they're, they're stuck um, uh, the surgery that I do is completely outside the abdomen so it has no effect on that at all. You said something about the muscle. That's on the outside. You've got skin, fat, a fascial layer of fat, muscle, fascia covering, uh, and then muscle, and then the peritoneum, and then the abdominal cavity. So everything that I do is outside the cavity. Now, one thing that you do, um, sometimes run into, um, depending on how stretched your skin is and has been, is that um, your skin, some people's skin stays sort of stretchy. It's like elastic. It's lost some of its elasticity and, it, and it's a little wibbly. Um, but sometimes some people's skin can be that way. Uh, and so, um, when, if you you know, you can get some stretching of the skin after the surgery, uh, and that's one of the potential long-term problems after the surgery. And, and one thing I would I, I would tell you is you know is trust me after you go through the first um, consultation you don't have any modesty with your surgeon. But treat them like your priest, you know. Tell them everything, you know, what you're happy with, what you're not happy with, you know, what your concerns are, and ask everything possible because. You know, they need to know what's bothering you, you know, so that you can get the best result you can. Make lists. Please come with a list of questions because, uh, you know, it's, you get in there and you forget. And so it's much better to write out that list and you can get it out and read from it. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always my husband. <laughs> I think I can remember from the chin to the toe. You said make a list. I can remember. Because <laughs> 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 I think you just slit my throat, pull everything up six inches. There you go. That's all. Why is that? That, that's how I, I, I joke with, with, with my son. I was going to be like one of those old power machines. You know, in the back. <laughs> <laughs> Which, which surgeon? Yes. Which surgeon would you call? Besides this one? Well, I mean, yes. Yeah. <laughs> there are a number of plastic surgeons in, in the Nashville area, and many of us do um, surgery on post bariatric patients. So you have a wide range of choices. So, yeah, I, I probably a, a good question to go along with that is like, what, what specifically? What type of questions should you ask for plastic surgery? So I think you brought some brochures. Um, oh, I, d I did. I brought some brochures. Um, and actually, some of the brochures have a list of questions to ask. 
Um, and also, a wonderful resource is um, the Plastic Surgery Society, uh, which is plasticsurgery.org. Um, and some of these uh, brochures have that uh, website on there. And my website also is listed on, on this. And you can go from my website to the Plastic Surgery Society uh, website. But on the Plastic Surgery Society website, they have all sorts of information about all different kinds of surgeries. Um, and you can find videos and uh, tons of pictures and uh, I don't know if they have chat rooms, but they have you know, lots and lots of information that is procedure specific, that can stimulate some questions. So it's always good to uh, go there first. And it's also very good to come see your plastic surgeon uh, more than once before your surgery. Because the first time is an introduction. Uh, you're, I'm meeting you, you're meeting me, or whoever you decide to go to. And um, uh, you have some ge generic questions. Um, and then you need to go back and you need to do some research um, on the different procedures that we talked about and decide what you want to do. And then you need to make a specific list. When can I start walking? When can I come out of my garment? When do my drains come out? When da 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 um, uh, And uh, that's really when you need that list, is when you come back for your second uh, visit before surgery and, and you're getting your last minute information. And then anything that you forget there, um, uh, most of us usually see patients uh, in the OR before we go to sleep. I always do because there's always something that comes up. And so I don't like anybody going to sleep until I've seen them that day. So just, how long, excuse me, how long does it take from the time you decide and have your appointment to you get actually scheduled for surgery? Oh, that's so variable. Is it? It's so variable. Now, some of these procedures can be long procedures. Right. And so um, it can take a couple months to get on the schedule. Um, if it's if they're short procedures, it doesn't take long. We can get you on the schedule fairly quickly, uh, within a month or so, depending. Um, but for long procedures that are four hours, um, and, and if they're combined procedures, um, then uh, we, we have to plan. So it's, it's quite variable. In, in, in the question was asked earlier, the other piece of advice I would offer from a patient's perspective is go see several surgeons. Mm -hmm. um, I I saw at least three before my surgery. And you know, for me some of the deciding factors were the thoroughness of the exam, you know, the kinds of conversations we had with, with the surgeon and um, because you know and, and look at their websites, look at their pictures, look at the results of their work. And decide, you know, do I like the way that's looking? And then take those examples to them and say, based on what you've seen of me, you know, can my results turn out that good or, or, or better? And, you know, I think certainly every, at least regular surgeon would be honest with you and say, no, I don't think you're going to look that way. Or, you know, yes, you can. Um, but, you know, this, just like you were hiring a contractor for your house, get several opinions. And you learn something from every consultant. And the average house will be different You know, I started to bring sort of a, a gross um, idea. It, it, it is so dependent on what exactly you need and how much time your specific procedure is going to take. That it's really hard um, to give. I remember mine. Do you remember yours? Yes, I do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was the loan was for sixteen thousand, and it was probably another four on top of that that insurance paid. So I like to say I got a twenty thousand dollar body. There you go. 
What did you have, Jan? Uh, I had the 360 and uh, the major boob job. Yeah. Yeah. We did, uh, we did quite a bit. And that was it so far. But if you're free tomorrow, I dream of things for you to do to me. <laughs> Um, it seems not, it kind of makes sense in my head, but I think it's going to come out dumb. So if you were, and I'll use for example your arm. So in the time period leading up before surgery, because you know, a lot of us are you know focused on working out and lifting weights and that kind of thing. So on one side, it makes sense that you would be trying to do your weights and everything to get rid of as much fat tissue, burn off as much fat before you had surgery. And on the other hand, it kind of makes sense that you would kind of slide off so there would be more skin. Less bulk, less yeah. Bulk. yeah, less bulk, more skin that you can take off. So then when you go back to the gym, it'll be even tighter. Does that make sense? It does make sense, but it really doesn't matter. Because you're still going to have that that muscle bulk, um, it's just going to be toned um, or not. Dr. Chester, is there ever a time when you have to say no? I can't do that, or it's not good for you, or yes. And I can't give you any specific examples. Um, uh, and it doesn't happen that often, but sometimes, yes, it does. I know that sometimes people have unrealistic expectations, and we can't you know that they won't be pleased with you know, what they're looking for. Are you saying that I'm not going to walk out with my allergies? <laughs> <laughs> Well, <laughs> I think you need a little bit more than time. Yeah. <laughs> Any final questions for Dr. Chester? I really appreciate your candid comments and um, answering all our questions and just coming and presenting to us tonight. I love your style. I love how calm you are. Mm -hmm. I can tell you've done this a few times. <laughs> And for letting us test her on broadcasting. Absolutely, Jane Ellen. This was really fun. <laughs> yes, we have to do more of these. <laughs> she should be coming to Hollywood tomorrow, right? Yeah. Yes. I kept looking at the pictures going, is that me? No, it's not. Is that? No, it's not me. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not me. <laughs> so, is there anything else that we need to do to kind of close it out? or? No, I'll just uh, I'll push the button. So that's all there is to it. So thank you, Dr. Chester. It was marvelous. And uh, thank you, everyone, for showing up and listening to her because she's great. And her collection of glasses is delightful. <laughs> so see you soon. Bye. 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 Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome.